of the Confluence Lecture is to stimulate and pr promote critical thinking and feeling on issues that are of importance to Unitarians, Universalists, and Unitarian Universalists in Canada and the world. The choice of topic is entrusted to the speaker, and the 15 lectures to date have been provocative, thoughtful, and inspiring. I am the Reverend Ann Barker, and as the most recent Confluence lecture f lecturer from 2021, I'm afforded the honor of welcoming and introducing this year's speaker, the Reverend Julie Stoneberg. Reverend Stoneberg served as a beloved parish minister in Canada for over 17 years, working with two Unitarian Universalist congregations in Ontario. She moved last summer to Wisconsin, where she is currently serving UU Church West as their interim minister. I know her to be a committed, caring, and service-oriented colleague. Among other roles, she has served as a facilitator for the UUMA Where Leads Our Call team, as well as on the executive our Canadian, of our Canadian chapter of the UU Ministers of Canada, as president and past president for a span of four years during my time in ministry. And I trust that you remember her as the co-chair of the Canadian Unitarian Council's Dismantling Racism Study Group for its first three years in partnership with Beverly Horton. Before I hand it over to our speaker, we would like to share one change that we're introducing this evening. UMOC encourages each Confluence speaker to embrace the opportunity to shape this event and make it their own. And while it began as a more traditional lecture with a moderated Q&A period to follow, it is, like our faith, something of a living tradition. Tonight, there will not be a Q&A time. Instead, Julie asked if I would offer a response to the lecture. This is a familiar practice among colleagues for essays like the annual Berry Street essay, but it's a new experience for a CUC gathering. I will share a brief personal reflection, doing my best to embrace the model that I'm learning from our collective work as you use living into the eighth principle. And I hold in mind the CUC responsibility covenant, which calls us to be accountable in relationship, especially by doing the inner work we need to do as well as the community covenant, which we use to bring us together in respectful, curious, discerning, and intentional care. Reverend Julie will be with us this evening and all day tomorrow, so there is time for interaction with her if you are moved and want to speak about this. For this hour, we invite you to listen, to take it in, and to reach. Now, the BC Region Ministers had the pleasure of selecting Rev. Julie for this honor. And here is some of what they shared. She's wise and insightful by nature, and so we trust and want to hear her insights about our strengths, our struggles, and where we need to go as a movement. The gift of her wisdom and insight is all wrapped up in a wonderfully grounded and heart-centered pastoral presence. With great joy, I call forward to the podium of the 16th Confluence Lecture, the Reverend Julie Stoneberg. Give him uh, oh my, I wish I could see you. <laughs> but I know you're there. Thanks for that sound. Feel free to keep making sounds so I know you're there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you, Anne, and thank you, my colleagues, for asking me to give this lecture. It's really truly an honor and a privilege and a special treat to have this opportunity to be back in Canada among beloveds, so many beloveds. As I'm sure we were reminded earlier, we are on traditional unsurrendered and unceded Algonquin Anishinaabe territory. And I want to acknowledge the history of colonialism that's, ev that's evident in this place, on a campus named for these peoples. Let's also remember that colonialism persists today in white supremacy culture and in racism toward black bodies and other bodies of color. I acknowledge these things in order to remember my place here as a guest and as a white settler, all of which I hope helps me to speak to you in a good and humble way. 
I'll add that I am a cisgender, hetero, educated, large size white woman of a certain age with a gray blonde asymmetrical haircut wearing a black dress. My perspective is shaped by spending most of my time swimming in the waters of the like-minded, which influences my perspective in ways that I struggle to change. Perhaps paradoxically, given my title, I acknowledge that my words are directed at other white privileged folks and rather ashamedly beg forgiveness from any who might feel excluded. If that's you, know that you have my wholehearted invitation to listen in and to be part of this conversation as you wish. I stand tonight on the shoulders of every Confluence lecturer in our CUC history. I have been changed by them and by all of the UUs who have ranted and cajoled and encouraged us to live into a vision of interdependence, love, and justice. I'm simply trying to, in a different way, to say many of the same things that Reverend Ann said two years ago, and Reverend Karen said six years ago, and Reverend Melora said seven years ago, and so on, a la Thomas King, it's turtles all the way down. My voice might be a bit more acerbic, perhaps less pastoral. My message will sound different from the others, but ultimately I'm just another turtle trying to hold up a world that includes a genuinely open-minded, theologically alive, truly welcoming, radically inclusive Unitarian Universalism here in Canada. Because I need it, because we need it. Yeah. Because I believe the world needs it. <laughs> and I want you to be one of the ones who stays with it. Because you matter. We need you. So, when I was in high school, I had a poster on my bedroom wall that said, storm clouds of love are gathering, the day of peace will be. Its hopeful message for me was that for there to be peace and just as a storm had to happen, a storm of love, an extreme change of weather, a transformation. That poster's been on my mind as I prepared for today. I believe we are all called to gather the power of love into a veritable storm. Storm clouds of love must gather if beloved community for all can be. So can we make a covenant together as we begin? You know, covenant is what binds us together. Having a lived covenant with one another is what makes it possible for all of us to welcome all. We need not think alike. And if we remain together, it's because we're able to love alike in covenant. Here's what I hope you'll covenant with me. First, oops. can you agree to be as honestly self-reflective as possible of yourself and your congregation and our associational life and to enter into that self-reflection with compassion, generosity, and curiosity? Then in conversations within yourself and with others throughout this weekend and beyond, can you risk being vulnerable, forthright, authentic, humble, honest, and always with kindness? And how about this? Will you stretch yourself to, into a willingness to let go of some of what you want? Now, I'm not talking about what you need. I'm not asking you to be, abuse yourself or to not take care of yourself. But I am thinking that the release of all of our built up stubborn ego and individualism is what could create the humidity, you know, the energy to form those storm clouds. And finally, can you, at least for this hour, put aside your reactivity to anything that might imply to you that you're not a good person? 
Thank you. <laughs> you might hear judgment, but can you try to let go of feeling judged or going into defensive mode? And I know this is a hard one for us. And as for me, I will covenant with you to do likewise. And I also covenant to own my own shit. I do. I've held these agreements in my mind as I prepared for tonight and promised to remain aware that the, fi that the final or only say is not mine. I do not have unerring wisdom. So let's just be in conversation here. We light the flame of this faith together as people in covenant, human to human, humans who care deeply about Unitarian Universalism. And here's a moment of blessing for all of us as we begin. This blessing was inspired by something I heard shared by Vivek Murthy, who is the current Surgeon General of the United States. If you're comfortable doing so, take your right hand and place it over your heart. Close your eyes. Think about the people who have loved you, the people who have been there for you during difficult times, who have supported you without judging you and who stood by your side even when it's hard. Think about the people who have celebrated your moments of greatest joy with you the people who derive pleasure just from seeing you happy. And let the storm cloud of love they created flow through you, lift you up, fill your heart. Remember that there is a love holding you, a love that is always there, a love that will not let you go. You carry all that love within you. You are and always will be worthy of that love. Now open your eyes. Love is a powerful thing, eh? Covenanting and connecting with one another, that too is love. As well as the central message of our faith, love is our birthright. Love is who we were designed to be and what we are designed to experience. And each of us has the ability to shine that love into all the relationships we have and, all into our and into our communities that all may know its power. So now, hearts open, ready. May the words of my mouth and the intention of my heart express the love I feel for you and for our faith. So here's my premise. As Unitarian Universalists in Canada and in the US, we make many claims about who we are. Open-minded, open-hearted, justice-seeking, welcoming, loving, rational, liberal, small l, inclusive. The proof of that ought to be in the pudding. Yet there are many, too many, who have come in our doors, have tasted our pudding, and well, have found that it is not all that. I believe that our very well-intentioned intentioned and aspirational desire to be open-minded and open-hearted is not yet reflected in our UU culture and our behaviors. Not yet. Which means that on a practical level, though we would wish it to be otherwise, the figurative doors to our spaces, our communities, and our congregations are more often closed than open. Now indeed, sometimes it is our desire to be open-minded that inadvertently shuts those doors. We want to be inclusive, yet when faced with what that reality asks of us, our automatic impulse is to draw inwards to protect ourselves. And in fact, it may just be that our belief that we're so darn open makes it hard for us to see when we are not. Our cups are too full of ourselves to see it any differently. And I would posit that our issues, interpersonally, societally, globally, all of our issues are rooted in our yet, as, as yet unevolved human ability to truly love our neighbor as ourself. 
to prioritize the well-being of all over our personal needs, to share resources, to respect one another in a pluralistic, interconnected web, basically to offer radical, open-hearted, and generous hospitality to each other. It may sound simple to throw open our minds and our doors, and yes, while that message is simple, the proof of its difficulty is that we still haven't been able to bake a show-stopping pudding. There are going to be a few times during my talk when we'll take a moment to breathe and reflect. Here's the first. This is a poem by Stephen Levine called, If Prayer Would Do It. And my esteemed colleague, Reverend Stephen Atkinson, is the voice you hear. If prayer would do it, I pray. If reading esteemed thinkers would do it, I'd be halfway through the patriarchs. If discourse would do it, I'd be sitting with his holiness every moment he was free. If contemplation would do it, I'd have translated the periodic table to hermit poems, converting matter to spirit. If even fighting would do it, I'd already be a black belt. If anything other than love could do it, I'd have done it already and left the hardest for last. If anything other than love could do it, I'd have done it already and left the hardest for last. Love in the form of open-mindedness and inclusion is so hard to do that we mostly just don't do it. And this means that there's a disconnect between who we say we are and who we are experienced to be. And since belonging and connection are among the greatest needs of every human being, perhaps more so for those who have marginalized identities, if we were truly radically inclusive, I dare say that we would be much larger and more influential, offering both a liberating message and a spiritual home to everyone who longs for that kind of pudding. Now years ago when the Minister's Association was doing the Who Are Our Neighbors program, we were all being tested for our intercultural competence. And we were told that to a person, everyone who participates in that testing believes themselves to be lost in their script. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it just closed on me. <laughs> okay, everyone to a person believes themselves to be farther along the continuum than they actually are. You may remember that Reverend Karen made reference to this reality in her Confluence lecture too. And this is true, this is the same kind of thing is true for this faith. I have no doubt that while we understand mostly on some level that whatever we say about who we are is more aspirational than an expression of reality, we also believe that we are further along that continuum than we actually are. We think we're more open-minded than we are, we think we're more welcoming and inclusive than we are. And we love hearing from our kind of fish who like our kind of water and we choose not to hear or to believe the voices of those who've not experienced that same welcome. Now that wasn't our fault. They just weren't a good fit for us. Now while what happens in most UU coffee hours, that time some would call a UU sacrament, does not capture the gravitas of what I want to say here, I think it is an indication of a pattern. Just think about it. Imagine yourself at your congregation's coffee hour. If you're someone who loves to talk, likes drinking coffee, and who gathers there with friends to shoot the breeze or to talk about congregational stuff or sports or whatever, chances are that you don't even notice those who make a beeline for the, who don't make a beeline for the fellowship hall. You don't take note of those who are standing alone around the periphery. You might not even see the person who sidles up to the edge of your conversation circle wanting to be let in. And if you're the person for whom coffee time is not so easy, I feel your pain. I can tell you that even as a minister, even when I've intentionally turned on every dormant schmoozing bone I can find within myself, I am sometimes that person who's not noticed or included, and any sense of belonging begins to elude me. 
So why do we keep doing it the way we do it? Why do we keep inviting people to stay and get to know us when it's so probable that they'll have a bad experience? Does coffee time help or hinder the building of beloved community? And I venture to say that we do it because it's just how we do things. Change is hard, especially when it means we have to change. Change begins at the edge of your comfort zone. So what does it look like to truly include someone? A colleague shared this story with me. She grew up in a middle-class white family with agricultural roots. They would periodically host international visitors in their ranch-style house filled with art from and photos of her parents' time serving in the Peace Corps in Liberia. And because of this, she grew up knowing that the world was bigger than her own. And she told me that while her parents had a global view, they still, understandably, taught their children a particular culture. For example, when it came to meals, they taught her not to talk with her mouth full or to put her elbows on the table. And my friend was about 11 years old when Salim, a colleague of her father's from Syria, came over for dinner. A rule-following child, she was quick to notice his father. her father had his forearms on the table and that her dad was, and that um, she was, that she couldn't stand it. So she was, began to point out her dad's wrong behavior, and then her mother quietly noted to her that their guest also had his forearms on the table, and her dad was simply helping Salim feel welcome by mirroring their guest's mannerisms. That's inclusion, eh? It's the platinum rule, a higher understanding of the golden rule to treat others not as we would like to be treated, but as they want to be treated. To welcome someone by adjusting to their way rather than asking them to adapt or adjust to ours. It's allowing ourselves to be changed in the interest of creating a space of belonging for someone else. It's not inclusion if you are inviting people into a space you're unwilling to change. Yeah. Letting go of doing it our way or of what we love and what is most familiar to us is hard. It might be the hardest kind of change to redirect ourselves toward a new way because when we love something like this faith, we give our all to it, our time, our talent, our treasure. Perhaps even we make of it a golden calf, something that we imagine to be permanent and unchanging and we polish it and we hold it up as the way and soon we find ourselves investing in keeping it the way that it is rather than allowing it to evolve or recreate itself into something new. Do you know about sunk cost theory? Here's an example. The transmission recently went out on my 2009 Toyota. Now I had religiously tended to that car and I'd planned to drive it into my grave. And while I don't think that I could ever love a car, it had become part of the picture of who I was in the world, you know? Not materialistic, willing to make do with what I had, an image that I'd like polished and held dear. But now a totally unexpected failure meant my car needed repairs far exceeding its value. And my impulse, and I really thought about this, was to go ahead with those repairs because, well, that would keep me on the same path. Now, had I done that, that would have been an example of sunk cost theory. Every change involves loss, and we do everything we possibly can to avoid losing things. Possessions, relationships, status, face, 
life as we know it. We tend to continue to invest in holding on to something that used to be good. That's easier, even when that thing has become irrelevant, even when letting go may be the better option. And after a nearly existential struggle, begrudgingly, I bought another car. Now, driving it continues to pose an identity crisis, but I expect I'll adjust. I can do hard things. Thanks, Reverend Ann. Yeah. Change is hard because people overestimate the value of what they have and underestimate the value of what they gain by giving that up. I was thinking the other day about change theory. I mean, who doesn't? <laughs> and about how modern day change theory runs counter to the biblical story of Saul on the Damascus Road. You know that story where he's struck by a certain light or awareness or conversion and he falls off his ride and is completely changed so much that he changes his name to Paul. And if you don't know that story, yeah, that Paul, Saint Paul. Raised fundamentalist Baptist, my default is to see that as the only true kind of spiritual experience or change, to be struck by lightning, converted, changed overnight. If I could just have that perfect kind of encounter where I was open and receptive to a message and the message was simultaneously perfectly keyed to my wavelength, then I could have that kind of transformational experience. Suddenly, totally, miraculously, I'd be different and so much better. But that's not how change happens. <laughs> Sorry, not usually. Setting aside what the pandemic required of us, we are changed at least most often over time, a lot of time with repeated messaging. And depending on the source of those messages and how they're communicating, and also depending on our own receptivity, we are impacted in some way. Now, sometimes we may get a whiff of one of those kind of aha moments, but mostly, though, it's just an imperceivable movement, a slight shift. I'm reminded of my high school band director, Dean Trespass. He was an excellent musician, intensely serious and quite acerbic, probably very frustrated by teaching well below his talent level. And he took our imperfection and our teenage lack of focus personally. We did not match his vision of the band he was meant to lead, and he repeatedly ranted with self-inflicted angst about not being able to find just the right message that would make us better musicians. And the pressure he put on us, grounded in his hopeful vision of leading an excellent band, was not well received. Which meant that some kids quit band in revolt. Now, Mr. Trespass was passionate about what he had to teach us and tried incessantly to change us, but he delivered his message in a way that made it difficult for us to learn. Now, while there is something really admirable about his dedication, and even though many of us became pretty darn good young musicians for others, he made the cost of learning too high. And I say this, I tell you this story, so that we will pay attention to our methods. The message can't be separated from how we treat and respond to one another. We know all too well that we haven't yet figured out what to do when we're not all playing the same tune, and that's why we have covenants. Taking a lesson from Mr. Trespass, let me try it in a different way. Back to change theory. Change often happens over the course of time and through repeated messaging, and we are most often changed by those who are closest to us on the continuum, change, continuum of change. Those at one extreme end can have little or no impact over those at the other end. 
are most receptive to those closest to us, those most like us. And likewise, we have the most impact on those nearest to us, most like us. And this was my experience while serving on the Dismantling Racism Study Group. There were and continue to be demanding calls to change embedded in that work. There were things I wanted and needed to learn, along with things I hoped I could teach or help to change. And though that team sometimes had differing opinions, we were close to one another on that dismantling racism continuum, and we changed one another. Now, as a teenage bassoon player, I could have been swayed either way to stay committed to the course of excellent music or to quit. And for reasons impossible to reconstruct from this distance, I stayed in band. Maybe it was because of the friends sitting next to me or my own love of music or the voice of Mr. Trespass, I don't know, some combination of all of that. You all have the same kinds of choices tonight and in every moment of your life. There are messages and there are receptors and you are a messenger, and you are a receptor, and you can choose which messages to share and which to, which to receive. Learning and change occurs in hospitable, just, and open spaces for conversation and truth-telling. The living of values and their communications are inseparable. That is, the method is the message. One of the questions I have when exploring models of change is about where and how our desire to be changed influences what happens. When is it that we're ready and willing to be changed? It's one thing to be in a situation, of course, where everyone wants to go in the same direction. And it's quite another when we're working at cross purposes against one another, pulling in opposite directions, resisting, believing our way is right, unwilling to be changed. And to complicate it, sometimes we don't even recognize when we're operating at those cross purposes. We can be aware, unaware of how stuck we are, numb to the messages we're sending, oblivious to what it might take to make a change, saying we're welcoming when that's not the experience many have, saying we're open-minded when in fact our doors are closed. And to complicate it even further, most of the time our reaction to new learning is to hear that call to change as an indication that we're not good people and we get defensive or we judge ourselves and is adequate. I really wonder what it would look like to go through life with beginner's mind, to understand not knowing as the highest kind of knowledge, seeking out opportunities to learn new things, even things that might unsettle our worldview, shake up our way of being, force us to make changes that require hard work, Now, can I assume that most everyone who would dedicate this time or make a financial investment in being present tonight is in sync with a similar goal? That given the theme of this symposium, that we're all here committed to learning how to live into the eighth principle, which calls us to dismantle racism and systemic barriers to full inclusion in ourselves and our institutions, I think not. The annual meeting today and the ongoing conflict that the Eighth Principle has wrought in our faith means I cannot assume this. I expect that some of you in this room or online now or watching this later are pulling in other directions, actively resisting it, either because you think the current course of action is flawed or because you have a different vision of what Unitarian Universalism is. This is real. It's how we are right now. Confused, conflicted, hurt, 
believing ourselves to be open-minded and radically welcoming, yet not there yet. I think when we congratulate ourselves for diversity, that means nothing has changed. It can be comforting to think that change will come slowly with repeated messaging, to just believe we're going to get there someday. But let's look at it another way. In calm weather, with no disruption, it's unlikely that we could ever be hit by lightning or have a conversion experience, let alone be inspired to make even a slight change in course because that messaging simply isn't getting to us. Think of how often we hear that people connect with their UU communities and their congregations because of being able to be with those who are like-minded. We create bubbles of like-mindedness we continue to espouse open-hearted, radical welcome, yet we continue to swim in a very limited pool of ideas and ways of being. If they happen to come through our doors, those who might be a little different, who exhibit diversity in any form, well, the greater their differences in terms of life experience, education, opinion, ability, culture, the more uncomfortable it is for everyone. There's this clash, you know, this rubbing, and we're not practiced at being receptive to messages that aren't familiar. It disrupts our sense of home. What would it take for us to truly set an intention to be changed? We are liberals who say we are open-minded and inclusive. We say we want our communities to be more diverse. We want to be open to others, and yet we resist the changes, even resist experimenting with the changes that could get us there. Are we really so fragile that our identity and sense of home is diminished by the presence of difference? Our resistance ignores those who have been waiting for us for a long time. It silences those who are waiting on the sidelines and ensures their voices will not be heard. Our resistance continues to harm those who have already rightfully claimed this as their own faith community, but who may live, act, embody, think, speak, or present in ways unfamiliar. And to resist their presence and contribution means that we lose those who could play a big role in living into our vision of a different world, a more inclusive and loving world. Without our intentionality, change simply comes too slowly for too many. And again, there's this difference between assimilation, limited inclusion, and belonging. Assimilation says which is what closes doors, be like us and leave parts of you behind. Limited inclusion says, be part of us and bring some uniqueness, but not too much. Belonging says, you belong here. This place is better because you are here and you are free to take up space. Have any of you watched the Netflix series, Amend? Yeah, yeah, it's about the US. But remember, put aside your reactivity. <laughs> the message in that series that touched me is that North American white society and culture have been telling people of, co out, people of color to wait, saying, we white folks got this. We're working on it. Just hold your horses. By all means, don't get angry. Or even, why can't you just get over it? 
which is the way Thomas King writes of being sidelined in The Inconven Inconvenient Indian. Now maybe on some level, we who are highly saturated with white culture also say this to ourselves. Hey, don't worry, we'll get to it when we have time. I'm gonna change, really I will, when it's convenient, when we get around to it. I mean, it's not like it's life or death, except that it is. We gotta recognize that if we truly are aspirational, if we really want to realize the beloved community, that day of peace and justice, then something has got to change. A weather front must move in. We gotta release all this pent up resistance. It's gotta rain and pour and we gotta get wet. And because we are so overwhelmed, and think we truly, and we think we truly are overwhelmed, we pull out our safe umbrellas and we duck into whatever shelters we can find, or we turn away in apathy, or we focus on some fake fight over language or pronouns or bylaws, or we choose, we actually make a very unfortunate choice for comfort or avoidance over change. We aren't practiced at doing it any other way. Do you know Dr. Maya Shankar's story? I was touched by Brene Brown's interview with her. She tells of being this promising young violinist studying with Itzhak Perlman, sacrificing her youth in pursuit of this dream, and then experiencing a stress injury to one of the ligaments in her fingers, rendering it impossible for her to continue on the path of becoming a world-class musician. And overnight, conversion experience, and not a welcome one. And while this kind of sudden experience leaves no option but to change, Dr. Shankar tells of the process of giving up something she loved, something that defined who she was, and of redirecting her energy and passion toward cognitive neuroscience, eventually serving on President Obama's team and as the first behavioral science consultant to the UN. And in that podcast interview, she reflected on what happens when we are so sure-footed, when we've built our identities on knowns, and then we're knocked off the path and have to figure out anew who we are. She suggests that it's really important for us to see our identity as malleable, to understand that we have an ability to embody new ways of being. This malleability allows us to navigate change with less fear. And oh dear, did I just say that F word? <laughs> fear. What could we possibly have to be afraid of? We are brave and fearless, are we not? We're not fragile. We live in a northern climate. We're strong and self-sufficient. We exist primarily at the center of white supremacy culture. So what is there to fear? Except losing things. Change. Any change threatens our sense of identity. It threatens our power. And yes, those who are white and able body and normative have power. It puts who we are and what we have given our lives to in question. And let's not underestimate how threatening a change in identity can be. It's a huge and palpable threat that results in anxiety and trepidation and discomfort and fear. And in that same podcast interview with Maya Shankar, Brene Brown said, in the midst of change, people get scared, double down, and irrelevance almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. In other words, fear is our greatest enemy. And what a conundrum that is. We want to change in order to be more relevant. Change causes fear. Fear causes doubling down. Doubling down and holding on too tightly leads to irrelevance. What if we could just see how scared we all are? 
So much of our reactivity, our unkind words, our lack of flexibility is because we're afraid. We're afraid that there'll be no place for us in this new world. We won't have the same kind of place. We're afraid that we'll become irrelevant. But it's exhausting to be so defensive and fearful. How could we show ourselves more compassion and understanding? Because we need it. Because here's the thing, the thing. If we don't respond to the current social and generational realities, if we don't do some changing, we may not survive the next 10 or 20 years. Nay, I predict we will not survive. And if we don't survive, this faith will not be present to play a role in the lives of real people to come. So we need to start asking, who will miss us if we are not here? And then put aside our own comfort and our fear and be there for them. Because if we don't, we won't be there for them or here to play a role in the transformation of the world, a role in building a beloved community of interdependence, love, and justice. We could throw everything we have into keeping things just the way they are. Or maybe we could find a way to acknowledge our penchant for calm weather while also learning how to welcome or even create storms of change. We could answer the call to be truly open-minded and radically inclusive, and if we were to do that, well, no, there'd be a big storm, and we'd get soaked, which would be okay, really. We got towels, we got indoor-outdoor skin, we're gonna be okay. You know, a friend recently told me about the Ivy Foundation. This Canadian charitable foundation was established in 1947 with a mission to improve the well-being of Canadians by giving grants to support issues of significance. Now, more recently, in response to the climate crisis, they made economics and the environment their strategic priority. And then, just this past November, the Ivy Foundation made the surprising announcement that it will close by the end of 2027. They are choosing to give away their $100 million endowment. And they're choosing to give it away now to enable their core partners on the front lines of Canada's climate and energy transition to make a difference now when it matters. They're letting go of their funds and their existence. They've decided that saving the environment is more important than holding on to their endowment. And that the time to do that is now. What would be the comparable action within Canadian Unitarian Universalism? What could we intentionally let go of in order to advance the causes that matter the most to us? Our pension for parliamentary process and right wording? <laughs> could we release our need to be comfortable or to hang on to our endowments, so to speak, our need to be right? At what future cost do we hold on to these things? Whether we're talking about coffee hour or the eighth principle, if God willing we were to actually embrace the call of change to exhale all that we're holding on to, maybe those storm clouds of love would gather. If we decided to join forces in a common goal to become relevant for future generations, what do we need to do? We are commanded to love our neighbor. This means we can. Love our neighbor? How? Don't look at me. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I just happen to be standing here right now. I, I mean it. I'm no expert on change, let alone on love. 
I can offer my voice and my willingness to be challenged and hopefully changed. I can tune myself to those voices and messages that stretch me just a little further. I can practice and keep on practicing open-heartedness. Thanks, Reverend Melora. What I do know for sure is that I can't do it alone. None of us can. As Reverend Ninan Soto has said, all of us need all of us to make it, to survive. Some change experts would say that change requires both courage and mastery, but we can't become masters without trying new things, that is, having the courage to step into uncharted waters and learn. When we acknowledge that we can't ever have the whole equation figured out, when we embrace beginner mind, then becoming actual agents of change will be easier. And this takes humility, intellectual humility, emotional humility, interpersonal humility. And here's another thing that I do know, the time to act is now. We can't say wait any longer. We are being called to jump in and to stir the waters. Remember, diversity is having a seat at the table. Inclusion is having a voice and belonging is that voice being heard. So let us stir those waters. Now here's another great thing that Dr. Shankar said. When change is happening, when it becomes clear that we're losing something, when we can't have it our way, consider what it is that you love and then mine the world for other, maybe better ways to create it. So what is it about Unitarian Universalism, about your faith, our faith that lights you up? Seriously, think on that. What is it? When you've got it, think about how it lights you up. What is it that you love about it? And if you were to lose that thing or your control of that thing, where or how else could you find that light? If doing coffee hour just the way you do it is what you love most, how can you create that experience in a more inclusive way? If democracy is not playing out the way you think it should, if Robert's rules aren't doing the trick, could your idea of what democracy is be changed to create an even better form of democracy? When faced with change, perhaps it would be helpful to work to imagine ourselves and our identities as being more malleable, more Play-Doh than bronze. Now I, for one, don't always appreciate being pegged as a female minister of a certain age. And I would love to exist in an alternate universe, one where my identity was more negotiable and where it would be okay for me to be wrong or a beginner or more carefree more in process than cast in the stone of expectations. In such an alternate reality, maybe we could even allow ourselves to embody new ways of being, ways that would allow us to move forward with less shame and criticism, less fear. Can you imagine a no shame, no judgment reality that would allow us to enlarge and grow our sense of identity as individuals, as a faith community? I mean, let's create that. When faced with change, I would hope that we could put aside our preconceived notions of what is and should be and set aside our know-it-allness and be open to learning. What can we learn from others or from our past experiences about how to navigate the change? What can we come to understand from one another just as worthy ways of being what can we come to understand from other, just as worthy ways of being in the world? You know, accessing that kind of broad library of knowledge from a place of true open-mindedness, well, would be a mind-blowing. It might even pop some of our self-contained bubbles 
allowing all of that beautiful efflorescence that we could offer the world to be shared. We could be so malleable, so willing, so open. I know it. All of us need all of us to make it. Fear not. Fear not. We can do hard things. Thanks again, Reverend Ann. We can all get wet and we're still going to survive. Opening our minds and opening our doors is sure to change us, but we've all gone through change before. There's no way that we can both help to build a better world and also keep things the way they are. Those two realities are completely incompatible. But I can assure you that our human ability to navigate change is not unprecedented. Believe me, change is always happening and change is going to keep happening and we can do it. And in the process, we can stop doing harm and start living now, now, into the radically inclusive relationality that is the beloved community. Breathe. Could you just put your hand over your heart again? Again, these words are inspired by those of Vivek Murthy. I just want all of you to know that you are worthy of love and belonging. Even in the moments when we feel that we perhaps aren't. Even those moments where we feel like we're the only one who might be struggling. The truth is we are not alone. There are others out there who want what we want and a world that is more connected, a world where we can actually be there for one another, a world that is powered by love. I believe it's within our grasp. Can you imagine it? This I believe. Who we are and who we can be is going to surprise us. I know my metaphors, they're always mixed up. We got these storm clouds of love accompanied by an accomplished orchestra raining down on a golden calf that's melting into Play-Doh that has its elbows on the table. I mean, a table where there's some potentially yummy pudding all reforming itself into, I don't know, everything, everywhere, all at once. A truly radically open and inclusive community. I believe that as we change, there will be beautiful, unexpected experiences. I believe that there will be unprecedented and multifaceted richness in our communities full of transformative growth and diversity. We got each other. And if we can truly become radically inclusive, letting go of our individual desires for the good, letting go of our individual desires for the good of the whole, then we will have more each others working and praying and singing together. This open-minded, alive, radical hosp hospitality will bring surprising gifts of learning, growth, and even more alarming transform transformation and change into our lives. Now, I do wonder, regardless of whether that sudden conversion experience was real or mythical, what was it like for Paul? Was he all wobbly and disoriented, maybe resisting it, blaming it on his horse or the weather or something? Or did he feel like some new and beautiful energy had entered his being? He had been one particular known thing, and then he was something else. Suddenly, he was changed. But whatever his experience of that change, if we follow that story through, that change led him to becoming one of the most powerful voices in the spread of his faith throughout the world. Change may be unwelcome. It may be surprising. It is inevitable. The question is, 
Are we willing to be changed in the service of a vision of true interdependence, love, and justice? Will we be intentional participants in creating a community known and truly experienced for our open doors and open minds? We can do this thing. And the time is now. It's up to you. It's up to all of us. May it be so. Thank you. Before you slip away from the stage, this is a gift from the Canadian Unitarian Council. Oh, thank you. They asked me to give it to you. Oh, my, it's heavy. It's a golden calf. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Am I supposed I to love open you. it? No. So the magic message just came in that we have to vacate the theater by 9.30. So you're going to help me. I'm going to talk as quickly but gracefully as I can, and then we will take our celebration and joy and conversation to the lobby. Thank you, Julie, for those powerful words and for the invitation to respond. And as I begin, I want to name that I, too, am a white, cisgendered female of a certain size with gray hair and a bucket load of privilege. When Julie and I talked about adding a response to this presentation, we wondered if I was, in fact, the best option for this moment. The decision we made together was not to ask a colleague with a marginalized identity to expend their labor on this task at this time. Julie's words were mostly directed to those of us who hold the power in the systems, and mine are too. I believe we are the people who can shift the balance of power voluntarily without making our allies fight for every inch of space. What rose up from Julie's words for me is the power and the familiarity of our reactivity. So I'm going to speak about my own but I expect it may resonate through the room. Did it happen for you when Rev. Julie talked about coffee hour? I totally wanted to say, now that must be an anomaly because our people are very friendly. And I also know it's not. That's not me, I wanted to respond. I talk to everyone at coffee hour. And then I would have completely dismissed her experience. And this is a pretty mild example of the ways we can believe that we have open minds and actually have closed doors at the same time. I often speak about being deeply impacted by the document that outlines the characteristics of white supremacy culture. Perhaps that was my conversion experience. Initially, I was gutted. I was alone when I read it the first time, and thank goodness for that. I felt defensive and reactive and angry and disappointed and ashamed. It was my ignorance that rocked me most, and then the overwhelming disappointment. And then I felt lost, like most everything I had been raised up in was turning out to be a disaster, so who was I? So feeling defensive, it's not, it wasn't my fault, don't be mad at me, I did not invent this. That made sense. When I don't reach for that three-second pause, that pause between feeling and acting, I go directly to reacting. But the bigger truth is, maybe I didn't invent this culture, but someone did. Because this cruel imbalance and brutal competition exists. 
It's not a theory, it's the lived experience of millions of people. And it's continuing all around us. And now I was a part of either keeping it alive or turning it around. At the time, I cried a lot. I felt cheated. I felt defeated. Are you tired about, of me making this all about me yet? Because I was. And I was quickly learning how that particular behavior, centering myself when the injury is not most profoundly mine, is the opposite of change. That's the digging in of heels that Julie was talking about. But we can change. Life can change. Once we understand how much our self-centered focus hurts everyone, then everything can shift. It starts with each of us working toward being that storm of love. I'm not an expert, I'm a learner. And my goal is to keep being a learner. We've come together to learn together, to help one another grow to listen when people are gracious enough to trust us with their truth. Julie reminded us that every change involves loss. It's a natural part of the process of this work. It's a part of our personal and our collective work, and it's good, important work. Because if we don't acknowledge and deal with our grief, then we build fortresses of defensiveness and reactivity around it. That's when we make our heartbreak somebody else's problem. And that somebody is most often our marginalized neighbors. We may lose some things that are familiar, and in losing and grieving and laying it down, we will find something different. We will find connection and community and ways to be useful that don't get in the way of anyone else's progress. We will find relief from the relentless competition. We will find ways to get out of the center, to share that space that we've had the monopoly on for so long. Because the alternative is losing everything. If you find yourself in a reactive or defensive space, you are not alone. We're here to build skills to do the work, to be able to find that three-second pause between impact and reaction. We are here to work together to round this sharp corner, not on the backs of our marginalized members and neighbors, not so that we can feel better about ourselves, but so that we can be together, all of us, because all of us need all of us to make it. Thank you for that, Reverend Soto. And thank you, Reverend Julie Stoneberg, for calling us to the table again and again with urgency and with grace. Thank you. Thank you, Julie, and thank you, Anne, for giving us thoughtful for reflection to start our weekend off on. I'd like to invite you to a social, symposium social. It's taking place at the Wolf's Den across from the Commons Theatre. 